Well, good evening, everyone. We're delighted that you could join us both virtually and uh, in person. Uh, I'm Steve Forster, and uh, I'm Andrew Lowe's co-author of uh, In Pursuit of the Perfect Portfolio. Is there a perfect portfolio of assets that an investor should have? How has academic and practitioner research contributed to our understanding of what the perfect portfolio looks like? I jotted down those two questions in July of 2010 in a file that I called Book Idea, Pursuit of the Perfect Portfolio. I was planning a sabbatical and I was looking for something to do that would focus on something that hopefully would be of interest to a broader audience than just uh, a narrow academic audience. And I thought this would be a fun topic to look at the history and evolution of portfolio management thought, uh, highlighting and explaining the key contributions by both practitioners and, uh, and researchers. My sabbatical got postponed for a year, so I put that aside. And then in February 2011, I saw an announcement for an upcoming conference in San Diego that was going to be hosted by Gifford Fung and the Journal of Investment Management. And my jaw dropped when I saw who the keynote presenters were going to be. Harry Markowitz, Bill Sharp, Myron Scholes, Marty Leibowitz, and Andrew Lowe. And I thought, this is just too good to be true. I've got to immediately sign up and uh, I've got to attend this conference. And I took a risk in my career. I took a risk by reaching out to Andrew and asking him what he thought of this crazy idea for this book and would he be interested in collaborating? And if so, could we chat at the conference? And I was delighted that uh, he um, said yes. And uh, so that's how the book project got started. He put us in touch with Harry Markowitz and then things uh, snowballed from there. But I want to tell you the real story that, that goes back even further, the real genesis for this book. And it goes back to 1984. I was a young second year PhD student at Wharton and somehow I survived the first year. I was convinced I was an admissions error, uh, but somehow I survived. And so here I was uh, in second year. I, I nervously arrived early at uh, a mandatory class. It was called Finance 733, Advanced Financial Economics, Dynamic Asset Pricing Models. I had no idea what the title really meant uh, I barely got through um, regular financial economics, so I was pretty nervous about a course on advanced financial economics. So in walks this rookie finance professor, even younger than, than me, and he introduced himself. Hi, I'm Andy Lowe. And within a few minutes, it was clear who the smartest person in the room was. And for those of you who have had the pleasure of having Andrew as your instructor, uh, I think you can certainly relate to that. And he, he, had a, he had a Harvard PhD. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to use the H word at a, an MIT alumni event, but uh, hopefully that's okay. So there were a couple of questions that I've always wondered about. One of the questions is, why did Andrew agree to collaborate with me? And the other question I, I wondered about is um, how he came to switch from Wharton to MIT, uh, switching away from great colleagues at, at, at Wharton, uh, like Jeremy Siegel, although an MIT grad uh, as, as well. So um, I took a look at the um, notes that I've kept all over all those years from my uh, PhD. Uh, days, and I pulled out the reading list for the course that, uh, that Andrew taught. And it occurred to me that, that the answers to those two questions were in this reading list. The reading list has 34 articles on it, and at the top of the second page, 
there are a couple of assigned readings by uh, Bob Schiller, another distinguished MIT grad and uh, one of our luminaries that we feature in our book. And then partway down, I noticed that there is uh, a reading uh, by Bob Merton on the mathematics and economic assumptions of continuous time models. And then I noticed there's a second article by Bob Merton, Lifetime Portfolio Selection Under Uncertainty, the Continuous Time Case. And a third Bob Merton uh, article, Optimum Consumption and Portfolio Rules of Continuous Time Models. And a fourth, The Theory of Rational Option Pricing. And a fifth, An Intertemporal Capital Asset Pricing Model. And a sixth, The Theory of Finance from the Perspective of Continuous Time. And a seventh, this one was with Terry Marsh, Aggregate Dividend Behavior and the Implications of the Tests of Stock Market Rationality. And finally, an eighth paper, on the microeconomic theory of investment under uncertainty. Eight papers out of 34. So it was clear to me now who, back in 1984, one of Andrew's intellectual heroes was, and that's Bob Merton. And by the end of the course, uh, he was an intellectual hero of mine. And that's the real reason why both of us decided to write this book, because it gave us an excuse and a chance to chat with our heroes. And I think that's also probably one of the reasons why Andrew was attracted to MIT. So I just want to say it's been a, a fabulous journey. Uh, it's been a, a, a lot of fun. Uh, it took us a, a decade to uh, get through of it, uh, through uh, our, our uh, writing. Um, but I want to thank Andrew and all of our luminaries. Um, and uh, we hope you enjoy the book and enjoy the evening. And I'll turn it over to Andrew now. So I'd like to, uh, to join Steve in welcoming all of you, uh, particularly alumni from MIT and, and, and Western University, uh, Ivy School, to this event. It's really quite a, a pleasure and an honor for you to be here uh, about our book. Um, normally, I would feel uh, quite a bit embarrassed about that, except in this case, I don't, because the book is not about us. Uh, it's about the 10 luminaries, and you're going to be hearing from three of them, uh, as well as uh, two uh, financial luminaries of the next generation uh, tonight. So um, also I should mention that this is the very first alumni event that we're holding in person uh, here with all of you. So this is a very special event um, and we're really grateful for, for you to actually make your way here uh, physically. Uh, it's a, quite a, a big commitment, uh, we appreciate it. Um, I, I'll just add a very few remarks to Steve's uh, because I think he framed it really well and I'm, I, I'm very grateful for his, his kind um, uh, comments about how, uh, how this book got started. Um, I have to say that the title of the book uh, I love and, and it's due to him. Steve came up with that title and I think it's, it's, it's the perfect title because all of us are searching for the perfect portfolio. None of us has a clue on how to uh, really come up with the correct answer except in my opinion for the 10 luminaries that, uh, that we were very blessed to have interviewed. And I say interviewed because in addition to meeting with them and talking to them about the book, we actually recorded all of those interviews. So it's available on YouTube. And you know, Steve is absolutely right. The motivation was hero worship. We had an opportunity to hang out with our heroes. And in that conference that Steve uh, mentioned um, that, that I was very privileged to be part of, um, Bill Sharp, Bob Merton, Harry Markowitz, Andrew Lowe. Which name does not belong? <laughs> and so both Steve and I took the opportunity to be able to uh, meet with uh, a number of, of our heroes. Uh, but before we get to tonight's event, I want to just say one more word, which is um, about how we chose uh, the, uh, the people to include, because we obviously couldn't include everybody. and. Um, First, I want to say that the choice was ours and ours alone. Nobody, none of the people that are featured in the book had any say about it, uh, nor did they apply to be part of the book. It was uh, our selection. <clears throat> and the reason that's important is because we were aware 
And I think many of you uh, are aware that this is certainly not a random sample, and it's not necessarily uh, representative in certain respects. Um, for example, there are no women uh, in this book. Uh, there are also very few practitioners. We have three very prominent practitioners. But for example, Warren Buffett is not in the book. Charlie Munger is not in the book. Uh, George Soros is not in the book. So we wanted to explain the logic behind the people that we chose. The idea of the book is this is about how do you create the perfect portfolio. And so we wanted to select individuals that not only thought about that, but were also willing to instruct others about how to do it. And, and that's a really key aspect. <clears throat> so Warren Buffett, obviously brilliant investor, and by many accounts, one of the best investors, uh, and perhaps the most perfect of all portfolios uh, in terms of the Berkshire Hathaway Fund. But he hasn't spent his entire career teaching others how to do what he did. And so unfortunately, if and when Warren Buffett ever passes away, a lot of his abilities will go with him. Now maybe Charlie Munger can carry on, but it's not clear that the next generation of investors will be able to maintain the track record that Buffett has amassed. It's really quite extraordinary. And the same is true with many of the other successful investors, many of whom are in the hedge fund industry, uh, a number of which I've had the great privilege of meeting. Jim Simons is a great example. I don't know if we'll ever see a track record like the Medallion Fund, but the fact is that if you were to ask Jim Simons how he does it, he'd smile at you and move on because he's not talking. And so the people that we chose were both uh, accomplished investors, but they also spent an enormous amount of time taking their ideas and helping others implement them. Uh, so that, that explains one aspect of it. The other aspect is the lack of, of women. And this is something that we were both very sensitive to at the very outset, and I want to speak to that directly. The main reason that we didn't include any is because, as most of you know, the financial industry is not particularly diverse. And um, in terms of the leaders, the thought leaders for investments, uh, we simply picked the ones that we felt were at the very top of the field. And there just aren't, aren't um, women at that level. However, that's changing. And one of the reasons that we wanted to ask Mila and Katie to to join is because they are examples of that next generation of leadership, and we're really excited about that. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Um, before I do that, so we're very uh, uh, grateful to have Bob, Jeremy, and Charlie here, three of the, of the 10 luminaries. And the others you can see, as I said, on video uh, in the interviews that we've done. But in addition, uh, we wanted to have uh, an example of that next generation, and so um, I'm very privileged uh, to be able to have uh, both Mila and Katie here. Both of them were students of mine. I had the great good fortune of being on their thesis committees. And like most of the very best students, and a number of them are in the audience as well, like Terrence is here, the very best students, it, it, there's not much advising that I do. It's basically um, you know, meeting with them on occasion to talk about their ideas and just getting out of their way and making sure that, uh, that we don't do anything to, um, to slow them down. And so that was true in both uh, Mila and Katie's case. Um, you can read about their bios. They're both very accomplished. They've won many awards. Uh, Mila is a professor at UMass Amherst. Uh, Katie is the chief investment strategist uh, at uh, uh, Alpha Simplex Group, a company that I uh, co-founded. But I want to tell you two stories about um, each of them, just to give you a little bit of a sense of, of who they are and, and um, uh, why I think they're ideally suited to play the role of moderator and get our discussion going. Uh, first with Mila. So when she was a grad student in system dynamics, she uh, didn't know any finance, and, uh, but w was interested in the subject. And so you know, we started working together on a particular project, but um, we, were, uh, we were approached by a government agency to work with them on systemic risk. And I have to say that I was a little bit unsure about whether we wanted to work with them or not, because this was um, an organization that I'll, I'll tell you about in a minute uh, that was involved in a variety of covert activities. And uh, they were very demanding and it ex it expected uh, that we would be able to work on a project focused on systemic risk. 
And so I, I was a little bit nervous about it, but uh, talking to Mila, she said, no, 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 we really should do it. It's in, in national interest. And that project turned out to be uh, the paper that we wrote in 2004 and five, where we projected um, the potential concerns about leverage building up uh, in the uh, hedge fund industry that was a precursor for the financial crisis. And 2005 was when we actually published that paper and described it. So it was a two year early warning system that ultimately that government organization, which is the Central Intelligence Agency, they actually took and implemented in some of their internal activities, none of which they've told us about since then. But it was really because of Mila's efforts that we ended up working with them. So now let me talk about Katie. So, uh, Katie was also a very precocious student, uh, working on lots of different topics. But in particular, it was her ability to blend mathematics with uh, quantitative problems in finance that got me so excited. We worked on papers with stop loss strategies, and uh, many people in finance argue that stop loss strategies don't work. You just buy and hold the market and don't worry about trading. But Katie developed a variety of mathematical results that showed that actually under certain conditions, stop loss strategies actually do work. Uh, and in the face of a number of naysayers in the industry, she has stood up uh, to them and has been able to win a number of awards uh, in the hedge fund industry for implementing those ideas. And to give you a sense of how iconoclastic she is, Katie decided when she graduated that she didn't want to take an academic job in the US but she was offered a position uh, as a faculty member um, in Sweden. And uh, so I talked to Katie one afternoon, I remember, and asked Katie, do you, uh, do you speak Swedish? She looks Swedish. Uh, no, does not speak a word of Swedish. But she decided that that would be a fun thing to do. And so she accepted the job, and she went over to Sweden, and uh, it was like two or three years later, I had the occasion to visit her there, and she spoke fluent Swedish, which is really remarkable. And you know, to this day, I'm, I marvel at her, her fortitude in getting involved in situations uh, that she's had you know, no particular reason to be able to do well, and then ultimately becomes an expert and excels. So I think both Katie and uh, Mila are examples of that next generation of financial leaders Mila, in particular, has actually written a paper recently on the fact that the financial industry, in the academic finance, which is related to the financial industry, that academic finance uh, is definitely biased, and the role of women uh, needs to be addressed. And so hopefully during the evening's conversation, Mila will be able to talk a bit about that research. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mila and Katie and, uh, and the, the rest of our uh, distinguished panelists. Thank you. Um, you guys can hear me? Wonderful. So let's start off and today we'll talk about perfect portfolio and hopefully by the end of it you will kind of come up with your best idea for perfect portfolio investing. But before talking about kind of returns, it's important to understand what risk is. So we'll talk about risk. But before even understanding what risk is, it's actually important to understand what risk free is, right? So the question to Bob Burton is, can you please, you know, talk a little bit about what do you mean by risk-free? And, uh, you know, students at MIT were kind of thought risk-free is kind of risk-free rate of treasury bill, but that's not what you think. And uh, can you think about does the definition change for different types of investors, right? If you're a government or if you're from a different country or if you're an um, alumni or a student and so on. So thank you. Well, thank you. This shows bravery on her part. Can you imagine starting a conference of this collection of people, investment people, for the most part, one way or another? What's more boring than indexing? It's the risk-free asset. <laughs> and that's what we start with, or I am. But I want to point out something to you that first, as a, just a logic, how do you know what's risky? What's the definition of a risky asset? I think if you think about it, it's really not directly well-defined. It's a complement to a well-defined concept called risk-free. Risky is everything that's not risk-free. Just like 
Linear is well defined, but nonlinear is just everything else. Okay? So it's pretty important that you know what the risk free asset is, even if you never invest in it, because otherwise you don't know what's risky. Now, at this level, you're saying, oh my God. So let me just point out a very concrete case where it has real implications, and one I think you'll all be familiar with, and that's the following. If you're going to pay your taxes now, it's a week away, but let's say in a month, what's the risk-free asset, U.S. dollars? It's a 30-day trade key bill. If you're managing a DB pension plan, what's the risk-free asset? It's the liabilities of that plan. Very long-dated bond for simplicity. Now, if you're paying your taxes and you buy a long-dated bond, you're taking a lot of risk in 30 days, as we've seen going on. And if you buy a treasury bill and you're doing retirement, you're taking a lot of risk. And so it's really important to get it right. Now, in the DB world, they understand that. I'd say they people understand it. They look at the funded ratio, not the value of the assets, because they know that's what matters. But let's take something like DC 401k, you know, the thing that's taking over retirement everywhere. What do we see when we go to our account? In fact, what do we have to put there? We put the AUM. We put the value of it. That's not what this thing is about. Just like Social Security or DB plan, what matters, what you're doing this for for retirement is defined by a stream of income in retirement. We all know that. But by putting that up there, it not only confuses people because they don't know where they are. A million dollars in the 10 year, 15 years ago was 50,000 a year. Two years ago, it was 6,000 a year, and today it's 23,000 all from the same amount of money. So how much information is there? But it gets worse. I'm putting, you know, I've only got a short time here, so I've got to tell the story quickly, okay? Target day funds, we all know what they are. I'm not gonna comment on them, but that they're trillions. They're, they're the thing. What do they have in common? You're supposed to make it less and less risky as you get closer to retirement. Let's not discuss whether that's the right thing, but that's what they do. Well, they do do that by putting it in fixed income, but what do they put it into? They should be putting it into long-term bonds, roughly matched duration to that, because it's supposed to be risk-free or close to it. What do they actually put it in? Well, it matters, but I'll tell you where they tend to be. They're more likely in the two and three year range. Why? Because if you put people into very long duration bonds, what happens to their price? Right? And people look at their screen and we're showing them their AUM and they see it go red. When it goes green, they smile. They think they're better off. Of course, the joke is they're worse off when it goes green on bonds and better off when it goes red. So I don't even get the direction right. <laughs> but this has real impact. That's what I wanted to say in my five minutes. Because they see this go down if you had the long-term bond, they think they've lost some of their retirement money. And if you're 61 years old and you're working, you know, you get on the phone to the HR department and say, what the hell is going on? You put us in these things. And the HR department doesn't like that. And so they call up whoever's managing and they say, this can't happen. And so whatever you know is the right thing to do, in the end, you know that if you don't go and get rid of that volatility, you're not going to have the account. And so we have target date funds with two and three year notes, which is absolutely the worst thing from a risk point of view. You can put someone who has a retirement account as their goal. So I'll basically quit on that, but think about this. This has real implications. And when we talk about risk, we should be using the right metric. The risk is not the risk of the value of the account the volatility account, 
It's the risk of the income that you can buy. It's the risk of the funded ratio. DB understands that, at least the CFOs who have to explain it to their boards and their CEO, okay? But we need to do this in 401k. So I thought I'd take this occasion to say, maybe not pretty darn boring, but I think it's pretty darn important. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So hopefully, you know, it's connected. So now anytime you hear about risk-free rate or risk-free asset, you know, you, you think about what Bob just mentioned. Thank you. Katie. All right, so I have the honor to, to ask a question to you, Charlie, and I'm going to preface this question with the fact that I am an active investment manager, um, so that this is kind of a fun one. Um, so your work on the loser's game helped to fuel the success and growth of index funds. You said, don't do anything by the way of active management, because when you try to do something, it is on average a mistake. And if you can't beat the market, you certainly should consider joining it. Is active investing over? Or is there a place <laughs> for active investing going forward? Well, of course, the irony is active investing is what sets the prices for the index funds. So active investing is essential. Uh, the second thing is, I believe rather deeply that it is possible to be successful in several different kinds of active investing. Um, I particularly, because I've spent a lot of time with equity managers, that there are certain kinds of, or certain equity managers who can do better than the market by enough to make it really worthwhile. And the problem is that they're not open to most investors and most investors wouldn't believe them if they were open and they would never get together. So it's, it's one of those things that's inconsequential. Now, I look at it a little bit in terms of my father-in-law, who was a pilot in the United States Navy. And if you know anything about Navy pilots, you would also know that they lose 1% or 2% every single year. It's a very dangerous line of work. And he was a career. Uh, rose to be a two-star admiral. Would have been a three-star, but he didn't believe in politics. He just did his job. He set a world record for the most dangerous thing I can imagine. An F-4 is a heavy fighter bomber. It comes into the aircraft carrier at about 450 miles an hour. It either catches the wire or you are part of a puff of flame. Uh, Admiral Koch set a record that will never be matched because they don't allow pilots to fly as much as they used to. And he was the bald eagle, which is the longest active serving pilot. He set a record for what scares the hell out of me just to think of it. At landing an aircraft carrier on an aircraft carrier is a small little postage stamp. I mean, it's tiny. Landing on an aircraft carrier at sea with swells that kill people on a regular basis is terrifically dangerous. Doing that at night is where he set his record. So I believe it's possible to do it, but I sure as hell am not going to do it myself. <laughs> and nobody I know would even let me begin to consider doing it. I have much the same reverence for those who've done active investing and are likely to continue doing active investing that is successful. And I'll give you a couple of ways in which you can do it. One is have a really small amount of assets, two, three, maybe four billion, more likely two or three billion, fairly high fee, because clients who are with you really understand this is a long-term game and the fee will get washed out if you're good as you think you are and they think you are and the record would suggest you are. Uh, then get a group of half a dozen or eight absolutely spectacular expert analysts who have known their industry for years and then skip the thousand largest companies and go looking for possibilities that might be interesting if you could get close and could make an impact on the thinking of the companies that manage. And I believe that's a chance to be really successful. The odds of anybody being able to design such an organization and get other people to join such an organization, I believe, are exceedingly small because there's so few of them. And for most people, candidly, you wouldn't be able to choose them if you knew all about it. It's too damn scary. And most of us will go to more conventional managers 
that are relatively large and have terrific relationship management skills, and good sales skills, and so on. And they are spending all of their time in the top 200 stocks, which are beautifully well-researched and wonderfully arbitraged by the active managers who are doing little bitty micro changes. But they've got the market. The market is never, ever perfect, but it's awfully damn good. And they have to pay the cost of fees plus the cost of operating expenses. And the operating expenses are not on average every day. It's on average over time because there are, oh, God, what the hell happened? Moments that happen in the market. <laughs> and that's when your transaction fees tend to go up. And then, of course, the investors have to pay taxes on anything that works out. It's a dreadful proposition. And the answer is, don't do it. <laughs> now, there is an alternative. And I'm going to give a sales pitch because I feel deeply about this. And I think Bob was very close to saying exactly what I believe is most important. So you might want to get him to comment on it. Now, I believe that there is a perfect portfolio. And I believe almost every, certainly everybody in this room, and I believe everybody that I have ever met has no effing idea how to figure out the perfect portfolio because they ignore an enormously important set of consequential factors and concentrate everything on one small fraction, the securities part of their portfolio. They don't have any idea what their Social Security is worth in net present value. It's not very hard to figure out. You don't need a slide rule. Now, you can, you can work it out pretty quickly with a piece of paper and be reasonably close, plus or minus 10%. They leave out, particularly young people, leave out this enormous amount of future income, or if you prefer, future savings, as a result of their intellectual property. Those are two enormously important propositions. Most people leave out their homes. Well, I recognize home is where you're going to live, but someday that house is going to be sold. And so it, we all know it could be, under extremis, be sold by you. And there are other factors that are in the financial set that really belong into the question of what is the portfolio. It's the total portfolio. And the result is that everybody in this room and almost every investor you will ever meet is way over invested in fixed income securities because they only look at the bond port and they, part, and they forget the fixed income of intellectual property because you can figure it out what it's going to be and you're not going to be wrong. You would been easily 6-7% of figuring it out if you're pretty good. If you went to the Sloan School, you're very good. So you ought to be able to get it within 4 or 5%. And the same thing is true of your Social Security benefits. Uh, it seems to me a shame that people have defined the problem in such a wrong way that they're now still looking for somebody who's going to beat the market in the equity portion of their portfolio. Who gives a damn compared to getting it right on the total structure of the portfolio? Because in the long run, and most of us are going to live for what we think of as the long run, returns in risk absorbing, risk as measured in days, months, years, not in centuries, risk management. Uh, causes people to underinvest in what they should be mostly invested in, which is diversified equity portfolio. Then I recognize there's a horrible risk that we turn out to be invaded by Russia and they take over our country and eliminate all the major companies that we invested in. I understand that risk, but that's the risk I'm willing to take. God, I drive. I took the train ride in this morning. I was reading in the last year, we've all read about train wrecks. I took a train ride in without any fear. I walked around in Manhattan. The other day, there was a guy on the subway that was doing terrible things. And you'd think, God, it's a risky neighborhood. So on and so I take that risk all the time. We're going through space at 14,000 miles a minute. That's a, risk is going on everywhere. But some of them we know how to live with, and some we don't know how to live with. I think it'd be a good idea if we learned how to live with market risk better than we do so it doesn't shake us loose as often as it does. Truth is, we're all going to live for a long time. We're all going to be investing for a long time. If you think about it in the long term, I think you come to a very different set of conclusions. If you look at all the different component parts, I know you come to a different conclusion as to how much you ought to have in fixed income securities in that particularly small part of your total portfolio. Maybe now we'll see Mila. You want to see what Jeremy yeah, wants to perfect. say? 
All right. So the third question is for Jeremy Siegel, and also kind of connecting to the let's think about the long run. So Jeremy, so we understand that you have um, for uh, the new edition, the sixth edition of your very popular. Uh, well-read book, um, Stocks for the Long Run, which is coming in this uh, fall. September, actually. September, perfect. So we're very excited to hear what, it, what you added. You added five new chapters, and one of it is called Is Value Investing Bad? <laughs> so can you maybe elaborate on that and just you know, yeah. give us the answer before the book is published? <laughs> <laughs> wow. First, let me comment. I mean, what Bob said is just so true. I mean, for the man who developed the intertemporal capital analysis pricing model, I, you know, to think about the fact that it's not just the prices, it's the stream later on. And what you're saying, the whole, you know, how many articles have been written? Now, why is the equity risk premium as high as it is? People, you know, I get so frightened, as we all know. And that was one of my theses that, uh, you know, when you take a look at the long run, I 220 years, uh, all the big bear markets just look like little blips on the upward movement, but it scares the bejesus out of people and they underinvest in, 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 in that. But getting to the question of, if, is value investing dead? I would say that if you asked me that question last November, December, I would say it's in the ICU, uh, barely breathing um, and about to expire. Yeah, I, in the last, Four months, it's made a great recovery. Uh, um, it's not, is it out of the ICU and into the regular hospital room yet? I'm not quite sure. Um, uh, uh, it is. Uh, I, I'm a great fan of indexing. Um, my own studies, however, did show when I did them back in 2007, so six, that a value tilt, and you can define it in different ways I'm going to talk about it, is does seem to give you a better risk return trade-off. Um, uh, however, since that, since 2006, value has not done well. Since the financial crisis, actually, value uh, stocks have not done well. Um, let's talk a little bit about the reasons, but I think that it's not a permanent situation. I think that, first of all, the original definition, Faba French on value, using book to market. I, I never liked book. And book, is, uh, book value has become less and less relevant, certainly in the technology age where intellectual capital is, is so important, R&D is so important, it is not there. I mean, what is the book value of Apple? I think I looked it up and it was $4 a share. Um, so, you know, does that give you any idea of its, its value? Um, if, you, if you capitalize R&D and use that as a book value, you get a, you get a better measure. You also do better on value if you use earnings. Dividends you also do better than the traditional value. So the other fundamentals, you know, if you would say book value, dividends, and earnings, the major fundamentals, um, earnings has done the best. I think dividends is slightly behind. Uh, and traditional value, using traditional book, has done the worst. That has a good explanation. What about, why haven't the others done well? Well, one of the reasons the other has, hasn't done well, I think, is buybacks. Um, and we could talk about the equivalence of buybacks and dividends. I mean, buybacks are a tax-efficient way to get return to, to share uh, holders. Um, uh, I remember I, I testified in Congress quite a few years ago on, on reform on the dividend tax, and I said, listen, if you want to put it on par with capital gains, what you should do is allow people who reinvest their dividends automatically, which is recommended widely, and, and I do it. I mean, I, everything I sign up for is recommended reinvestment dividends. You don't pay a tax on it until you sell it. So if you reinvest it, you don't. Then you would put it on par with that. I think you would greatly increase dividends and, and greatly reduce buybacks. Um, although management options are also usually done on price, which is another motivation for that, but that can be corrected too. But anyways, the buybacks, I think, is it. And, and one thing, if you do a study, Buybacks are a positive factor. Um, I have another chapter that's related to his value investing debt called the Factor Zoo, 
the zoo, I mean, many of you read the John Cochran's great uh, presidential uh, address that's uh, by the American Finance Association called the Factors Zoo, where everyone is finding so many different factors that beat the fully diversified capitalization weighted factor that were lost uh, basically uh, in, in a zoo. Um, you know, the interesting thing is, first of all, very few factors have worked, and that's one of the things I show in the book, since 2006. Now we have a Fama French going back to 20, say the Chris data set, and we have many of the others series start in the mid 1960s. They do great, even momentum, which is the strongest factor. Momentum has done virtually nothing in the last 15 years. Almost all the factors, very few of them, have done very well. Um, what has risen in our and why value has done badly is, of course, the great growth of megatech. Uh, the Amazons, the Apples, uh, the Microsofts, and, and you know the names. You know, they sometimes call the FANG stocks. It, it is unprecedented when you take a look at the top capitalization in the world. I mean, I, I think of, of the, the only one is Saudi Aramco that gets in there, uh, even be, below Apple. Um, uh, the oil company, uh, they're all of, 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 of the tech names. That debt growth has been unprecedented. And let me also say something else. People say, is it like 2000? No. Uh, it's, it, that surge was much better supported by earnings. The, when I say the surge, the surge that existed until, let's say, November, December of, of, of last year. Really, you, the tech sector really earned at a bigger rate. It wasn't just PE ratios. Now, I'm not talking about the super high, you know, you know, the, the, the Pelotons and the DocuSigns and, and all those that went to incredible Zooms that, that have crashed, that went to incredible uh, ratios. I'm talking about those that, you know, basically uh, uh, form the, the, they did do better. And there's almost no period of time where, you can have one sector that so consistently outperforms. Yeah. But I also have another chapter about top dogs. Do they stay on top? These are top capitalization ones. Do they actually stay on top? And uh, one of my chapters on this whole thing is in 1950. What would you rather, if you were going to hold, let's say you were forming, pardon, I'll, end, I'll end at this. Um, if you were forming a portfolio, this is before, you had two choices uh, for your granddaughter and say, you're not going to open up until you retire 60 years later. Um, and you had two stocks, IBM, which was a tiny little stock back then because it was before it developed the computer and everything else, and uh, ExxonMobil, which was Standard Oil in New Jersey back then. And suppose at that time a genie came out and told you the growth rate of dividends, earnings, all the fundamentals into the future. Um, of each of those companies. IBM won on everything. Faster earnings per share growth, faster uh, dividend growth, faster everything. If you would have held it 60 years, what would you have done better on? ExxonMobil. Mm -hmm. And the simple reason is because the price was lower relative to the fundamentals. What everything Wall Street goes for is growth. But in the long run, price relative to the fundamentals wins out. And even if you extend it, the next 10 years, you know, in 60 to 10 and in, into 20 and 21, 22, um, you still get the beat. Um, they don't, it's price to fundamentals does count. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit about that um, in, 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 next in our next part. Yeah. Um, so thank you, thank you very much. And we are looking forward to actually reading about it in the September. Um, so before we move to the next question, I just wanted to give an opportunity for all of you to comment if you have a comment to each other's answers. Yes, I have a comment. I wish I'd given my time, time to Bob Merton and Terry Siegel. <laughs> oh, no. You did very well. <laughs> I learned a lot. I, I mean, I, I, the idea—I mean, well, the idea of taking into account all your assets—and that's part of one of the th things I talked about. You know, w when w when do you deviate from a cap-weighted portfolio? Well, talk about the other assets and the correlations that your other assets have with those other assets that are there. 
would move you away from a strict uh, cap weighted portfolio to provide uh, an asset efficient portfolio. I think that's a, a, a very, very important point. By the way, I added real estate for the first time. Stock for only didn't have real estate. I added that a half a chapter on long-term real estate returns. It's kind of interesting. I won't go into them right now, but um, as of course, as you mentioned, your home also is being a major asset for, an, uh, for many people. And in terms, their major asset for many people, and in terms of aggregate assets, it's just, I, I think it's just below stocks and bonds in terms of aggregate value of real estate. So I think at this point, we will switch to our core question here, where I'm gonna ask all of you uh, to comment on what you think of as your perfect portfolio, or the perfect <laughs> portfolio, um, if you wanna be a little more general. So maybe we start with you this time, Jeremy? Okay. Um, when, actually the first, I guess three editions of Stocks for the Long Run, I, I, was, a, I'm, I was a huge fan of, of Bogle and Vanguard and index funds. Uh, I still am. Um, and, um, you know, Vanguard, uh, I visited the camp, you know, I'm, I'm, I live in Philadelphia, so Malvern was very close, and Jack Bogle invited me over, and um, I got, got to know him, um, very interesting man. Um, when I did the research that found out that if you, if you actually did it, and this was again in, in, in around 2010, 8, 9, 10, if you took a look at relative to fundamentals, if you tilted your portfolio in that direction, you would have a slightly better risk return trade-off. It seemed like Jack divorced me. I mean, <laughs> um, it, it, uh, he was very upset that I deviated from the true path of, of uh, you know, a total cap-weighted. I still own a lot of cap-weighted, but I, the reason why I still believe in a tilt um, is really because I don't believe the economy is efficient at a point of time. You have to have active investors. You have, it can't be efficient. We, I mean, you know, Gro Grossman showed it, Stiglitz and Grossman. You can't have a per perfectly efficient market. No one would do any analysis and you wouldn't have prices. So, I mean, there has to be inefficiencies in there uh, to some extent. Now, finding them, of course, you could say, yeah, but who, who is able to, to basically find them? Well, you know, one thing that, impressed me a lot in the development of, of, of finance literature over the last 15 years is, and, and Fisher Black is really, and he, he, he had a title of his American finance uh, address, I forget what year, it was called Noise, remember that one? I mean, where he said, you know, there are noise traders out there that are moving prices around not related to fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, he kind of shocked people when he actually said, uh, he was asked, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, how close to, would you call an efficient market? He said within a factor of two of its true price, if you actually knew it, you know, people say a factor of two, my God. Yeah, I would call that, when it's out of thought of that, then it's not really being an efficient market. So there's a lot of, how do you, how do you do that? Well, if you think, and I, I, I guess I coined the term, I actually wrote a, a, a very short article on this called the, the instead of the efficient market hypothesis, the noisy market hypothesis, where you actually, it's efficient, but noise traders are bouncing it around. Well, in that case, if you do take relative to fundamentals, like earnings or when it tilted in that way, you're not picking stocks, you don't know anything, but just the fact that it vibrates around there, you're going to pick stocks that are going to be on average slightly more undervalued. So I began to advocate a more a tilt towards value. Of course, just at the time that value crashed <laughs> relative, to, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's like in the cards, but um, uh, because of this extraordinary growth, as I mentioned in my earlier talk on, on that. However, I'm still that way. By the way, I was also for global. That hasn't done well. Why hasn't it? Gold hasn't done well, honestly, because value hasn't done well. Because, you know, the, the, those big tech companies were the United States. I mean, tech outside the United States, except for one or two small ones, it just doesn't exist. So you take gold to Europe, you're in a value portfolio. Um, you go to emerging markets, you're in a value portfolio. I mean, um, so obviously people say, oh, no, that didn't work. Value, you know, international didn't work in that. But it's really, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same problem. 
um, that, that what we had was this unprecedented growth. Now, again, some people say that will continue and, you know, then, you know, there's, there's no way to disprove it. But long-term history suggests that if you, <laughs> nothing stays on top forever. Um, as I say, even IBM, which outperformed everything else for a long time and was the only computer company. And in fact, IBM and computer almost became a synonymous word, as we all know, has fallen, fallen from grace. Thank you. Charlie, would you like to? Yeah, I would like to ask a question. But before that, I've got a question for Bob. You have, I think, correctly identified one of the really serious problems in retirement security. And that is people taking target take funds and assuming that's it, it must be right. And if you take an objective look at it, it ain't right. It's got serious problems. And then if you say, wait a minute, everybody is different, so you ought to custom tailor to everybody, it's another degree of not right. I'm willing to accept the don't worry about the detailing. Get the basic proposition right, because most people can't be accurate about their tolerance for risk, how much money they really have to invest. They keep thinking about only the securities part. Uh, they really think in terms of what they want to have is comfort and safety in the long run, and they don't know how to evaluate that. So there's a lot of flutter or noise around the edges. But the basic proposition that the target date funds follow is awfully damn close to put your age in bonds and the rest will work out pretty much fine. <laughs> and yeah. that is baloney. Uh, and I'd like very much for you to talk about that more. And while you're do, getting your thoughts together, I would like to raise, do a quick survey. Mm -hmm. How many people, and I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand if the answer is yes, I could. How many of us could write 25 words or more about Alfred Sloan? The majority has it. Uh, I'm sorry, the minority has it. Alfred Sloan is the greatest, in my view, organization developer of a mass production, mass distribution organization that transformed American management from dark ages into world leadership and created what at the time was widely recognized and understood as one of the great corporations of all time, General Motors. Mm -hmm. And if you want to know more about him, I strongly recommend the book he wrote with a Time Life gifted writer, My Years at General Motors. It is not a long book. It is a brilliant articulation of a brilliant man's reconceptualization of what need was needed if you're going to produce large numbers of automobiles at a low cost and they're relative to value. And it was so strong that it created a culture that sustained itself for years and years and years, and then basically partly out of date and partly got ruined from, in the, from the inside. But he is one of the great people of all time. And what's really important for all of us is not that it's a great story and it's a wonderful American experience, but that the concept of being able to think through from first principles the whole spectrum of a major complex organization, which he did and helped his organization to do, can be done. For example, I believe that David Swenson, managing Yale's endowment, did much the same thing for endowment management. And the power of that kind of original thinking and then putting it to work, in my view, is one of the great lessons, not of a lifetime, but of any time. And every one of us can have access to it, and that's just one illustration, but it's an illustration that tells the whole damn story. And so I would encourage you to read it. Uh, if you don't have time for that and want to read something else, then I think I'd come back to Bob's wonderful literature and the recommendation to read that because it's fabulous. Mm. But target date funds. Thank you. Would you like to think okay. of the, your perfect portfolio? Uh, so I first want to say I picked target date funds as a shorthand to illustrate the issue because everybody's aware of those. 
I didn't want to give a commentary. I will only say one thing that's related to this. What does it, I'm talking about a traditional target date fund. You know, they've gotten to find, you know, smart target date funds, which is meaning it's not a target date fund as we did it. So I agree with smart. And then the question is, how do you do it? But target date funds, what do they use? Either your age or the date that they think that you're going to retire, which are pretty close, right? Now, what is the information set for that? Do you know how old you're going to be a year from now? You see who I'm pointing to, all, all four of you. You do. How about five years from now? In other words, the only thing a target date fund uses to change anything is your age. And you already know all of that now. In other words, as a reduced form, this is an investment strategy that it knows never updates. It never uses any new information about you or the markets. Now, if it were true as a practical matter that that was good enough to get you to a good retirement in 10, 20, 30, or 40 years, those of us who are in the financial service business really should look for another profession because that's a very complex intertemporal optimization problem under uncertainty. And if a rule that doesn't update, let alone be different for different people, it just doesn't update, any new information is good enough, then this is a pretty easy field. We don't need any of all these resources we're using. That's end of story. We could talk longer on it, but I think- Well, there's another dimension of the story that I think is worth adding on, and that is, Average age of retirement is something around 63, and average age of death is close to 86. Yeah. And for me, because I'm in the middle of that period, I think that's a really important difference. Well, look, you know, we all know that it's not that what we're saying is you're saying is isn't interesting. It's too interesting. And if you get me going on this, we're going to be here very late, and I'm going to be in a lot of trouble with everyone. So, <laughs> Charlie, please let me just say. Tune in, we can have that conversation another time. But, but I just wanted to, just if you've never thought about it, just think of an investment strategy that never updates for decades any information. And ask yourself, common sense, all right? So now I'll, I'll, I have to talk about my version of the perfect Please. portfolio. And I confess to you, to my colleagues here, but to you too, I engineered the change in order. I got Jeremy and Charlie to go before me because my perfect portfolio story for you is not what you should mix or do or you know, whether you index or whether you tilt or all that. All extremely important, and that's why I wanted them to tell you. So all I can do is you know, whichever flavor or mix of flavor that you got from our, my two colleagues here, let's get that as given. But what I want to talk about is give me the most efficient portfolio. You understand what I mean by that, whether it's yours, Jeremy, or yours, Charlie. And you know, I'm not going to get into the multi dimensions of risk, just that portfolio. That's a good start. What I want to talk about is where do you go from there? And what I mean by that is you know, people pay huge sums of money for alpha and go after it because they're paid you sums of money for it, all right? I think if you, know, if you can do it, great. I have one, and I won't say who it is. I have one student of mine of many years ago who wasn't Jim Simons, obviously, but he had the second best performing hedge fund over the last 25 years or so. So I, I believe there are people that can do that. But coming to my point, what I want to say to you is two words. It's not plastics as in the graduate. Uh, but it's one, there are three ways to manage risk. Diversification, hedging, that's the risk-free asset, and insurance. In both the institutional as well as the retail space, the first two are overwhelmingly well used. Very little is done in insurance. There are special cases and so forth. That's crazy. 
in 2022, if you've got three techniques and you're a sovereign wealth fund or a sophisticated investor, why do you tie your arm around your back and say, I'm only going to use two? Now, you might say I have a vested interest because options are, of course, the prototypical case of insurance. But think about it. It's a different pattern. They're not replicable from one another unless you do dynamic trading. So the first point is insurance. That's where it's going. Now, it's a big business, and it's complicated. And some will want right insurance, and some will buy it. And sovereign wealth funds may find that's a better substitute, for example, than junk bonds. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with junk bonds. Okay? So I don't want to get into how that happened, but I think that's going to be a big area, and it's going to be helped by technology, it's going to be helped by markets, and it's going to be helped with the fact that it's damn hard to get alpha. It's a very competitive business. Keep getting it. That's why I wanted their portfolios. They got every alpha in the world in it, and you can add yours. Now you got that. That's what I want to start with. How do I improve performance when you can't get any more alpha in the way it's defined? You will see that if you're willing to define what the objective of the portfolio is. Okay? And that's work. What are you trying to achieve with this portfolio? Now, the best known case of that, just to make it concrete, my, I'm looking at the clock, you know, a defined benefit plan, right? If you, could, if you can fund 100% of your commitments, you've done your job for that portfolio. Now, if you get theater tickets on top of that, that's nice, but that's not the goal of the portfolio. That's not the purpose. So you have a clearly defined place you'd like to be. And I won't go into the rest of this, but just from that, what does that tell me? It tells me, and I'm doing this really fast, but if you think about it, I can take their portfolios and Warren Buffett or my former student, <laughs> and I can improve performance. I can't produce more alpha, but I can perform better, and I can prove that to you. If your goal is what you're trying to get to, let's just say you know, fully funded, whatever that number is, then at a minimum, sell off everything you have from their portfolio above that goal. You see it a lot, just, and you could do that in theory, right, by selling an option on their portfolio at that goal price. Now, you're giving that all up, but if your purpose is to get to the goal, that doesn't help you get to the goal. The theater tickets are nice, but they don't get to the goal. And by the way, just because you know options have value, in fact, you'll get a premium if you sell that option, or more is never free. You pay for it. And if you pay for it and it's not helping you get to the goal, I know how I can beat you, no matter how smart you are. Because you're throwing money away relative to the goal. I'm just trying to show you quickly logic, not the detail. So goals-based investing is a way to improve performance. Let's say they absolutely had the same portfolio. They didn't know it, but they're competing. So their outcomes are going to be identical on their best portfolio. Okay. If one of them sells off the goal, above the goal, and the other doesn't, that person's going to win. Why? Because the resources taken from selling off the goal can put more in their portfolio than the one who doesn't. The or more is never free. So it's simply 95, not picking on you, Jeremy, because you didn't do it. It's your portfolio, but they didn't know it. If you want the or more, actually only 95 out of 100 is actually working for the goal. The other five is for the or more. But if we take Charlie, and they're both the same portfolio, so there's, you know, there's no, you know, you know what the outcome's going to be between them in their portfolio. If you sell up the goal and you put that research, Charlie's going to win every time. And I could show you to that. I've tried to demonstrate it, self-exemplify. Without a blackboard, without a computer, without doing any simulations or assuming any distribution. Draw it out when you go home tonight, and you'll see that the chances of getting to the goal are higher 
with applied to Charlie versus Jeremy, even though they had the same portfolio. Okay. And the shortfall is always lower. Now, how does that sound to you? I've got a strategy that has a higher probability of success being the goal, and when you fail, you lose less. And you never come out behind between here and the goal. I'll stop on that, but I want there's a lot that we can do for performance enhancement, which is not about picking faster, quicker, smarter. I have some long time ago colleagues, not well, in the room, who are faster and smarter and quicker. So there's nothing wrong with that. But you don't need that to improve performance. And I see this as the realm for the future. It's hard work because you've got to figure out the goal. You got to, and you can change goals, that's fine. You know, your your travel agent, you know, you book tickets to London and then you call them up and you say, no, I'm not going to London, I'm going to San Francisco. That's a new goal, they change the ticket. You know, no big deal. All right? So that's my message to you, and that's why I wanted you to go first. Because I don't know which one of them is better. They're probably both damn good things to do. You know, not bad. And all I wanted to say is that maybe I could put a cherry on the top and point to you a direction of a very big area, mm -hmm. if you investigate it, for adding significant performance, OK? Uh, and that's where I'll leave it. And that yeah. also reduces risk, right? Pardon? That's also a reduction of risk. So if you well, do a diversification yeah, but, but and insurance. But you see, uh, this is where we have to be careful. When, yeah. When we talk about risk, you have to define, you remember I said you have to define the risk-free asset? Well, you have to define the risky mm -hmm. asset. Yeah. I mean, is it standard deviation? Is it, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm trying to say to you is that if you can tailor things, we have the tools, and we're going to have many more of you. I'm looking out at the audience. You're all young. Uh, you know, everything's relative, right? Yeah, you're all young. And so you've got a lot of runway in front of you. You want to do things. And I'm just saying that you've got the opportunity here to develop whole new big areas of performance improvement that is not measured by standard deviation or some other metric of spread, mm -hmm. but is absolutely clear that it outperforms. So in the interest of time, maybe we can start by yeah. getting audience participation. And yes, yes. absolutely. Questions. Thank you, Andrew. Sure. And I apologize to you for taking more time. The clock no. went to zero. And maybe I should have realized that means I should stop. And I said, oh, it's not changing, so I'm not losing any time. So some, some class go minus, but this one doesn't. Yeah, that's, that's right. Steve, would you like to, uh, to ask the, uh, the take the first audience question? Sure, we have some questions but that have been. Before we do that, can I make a volunteer? Sure. Because I think what Bob said, is, as I expected, is terrific. Uh, everybody in this room is different. And I can prove it to you. Tomorrow morning, when you get up to get dressed, how would you feel about wearing my shoes, my suit, my eyeglasses? That's just a small fraction, but my waist has got to be fine for you. My shoulder width, sleeve length has got to be fine for you. My need for ocular improvements has got to be fine for you. And I've just begun. Why can't we take the same attitude towards our portfolios and recognize that there is no perfect portfolio, there are millions of perfect portfolios, and each one of us has a solemn obligation to go and figure out, which is the hardest part of what could be successful investing, what is it that we really, really, really want so we can optimize against what is accurately what we want. And most of us have no effing idea what we really want we're just going at it and worrying about what's going to happen next month or so or maybe next year or so. And we can't turn to Bob and say, Bob, would you now work out what we should have as a portfolio structure? Because we're not willing to give him an answer to the really important question, what's the goal? Excellent. We, we, have we an could audience. figure it out reasonably closely. And we could figure out what all those other assets are and then give him a relatively modest question. What would you do with the incremental part of the total portfolio that's in securities? And what would you do for me, given what I'm trying to accomplish in the life I know I'm going to lead 
and the life I hope I'm going to lead kind of blended together. Speaking of assets, uh, well, there's an audience question, uh, and we'll see if we can get a quick response, so we can get a couple of questions in. Um, what's the panel's opinion on investing in cryptocurrency and uh, NFTs? <laughs> For those who know that sort of thing, it's just the sort of thing they like. And I will pass. I'm an art history major, and I have no responsibility for understanding the most advanced type of potential for tradable options. Leave it uh, out. Well, I get that. I mean, that's always like the first question, uh, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> Notice none of us talked about it, but um, <laughs> uh, I guess, uh, and cryptos are $2 trillion. I mean, not enormous, but not insignificant. Um, um, I, I, I've added a half a chapter on it. I, I used to have gold money and the Fed. Now I have gold money, Bitcoin and the Fed uh, in my new book, since uh, you, know, you have to address it. Um, I'm going to say it's just a couple words. I, I, um, I don't, th there's one blockchain aside about building, you know, that. I don't think it can become a successful unit of account, which is essential for a money and medium of exchange. The, if the banking system would reform itself, and I'm talking also the international banking system, you know, they, 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 they switch to, to Bitcoin in El Salvador because they get 20, $15 billion of remittance from the US and Western Union and everyone else charges so much money. I mean, it's not, it's not a, a competitive market uh, for transfers. Um, if the banking system get its act together, uh, for instance, I, I, uh, Zelle, there was an article, uh, Zelle has exploded. I, I use it. Um, it's, it costs something like two basis points to transfer. And uh, someone said, let's have a Zelle card because merchants would only charge two basis points. But, oh, no, the banks don't want it I, uh, because... They're making so much money on credit cards. So they charge the merchant 3% and they give you 2% back. That's a crazy system. And 2% and of, you know, six, two thirds of GDP is consumption. They're being paid that way. We're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars. I mean, it's, it's a crazy system that we have that if we allowed the banking system to become more efficient, Bitcoin would have no chance as an alternative currency. Not saying it, the, the blockchain part of it, in terms of recording and all that. I'm just talking about alternative currency. That's one thing I'm going to say. I think you want me to respond to that too? <laughs> uh, let, let me just kind of try to bullet points. That's hard for me. But uh, the first one, I agree with Jeremy. I don't think that you, in fact, I don't think you can have a non-legal tender currency, period. I, I, you know, I just don't believe that. And we could go into why, but so, and, and I think I've been told that you stopped saying that, Bob, because even the diehards in Bitcoin gate of uh, it becoming the currency, and it's now being put out as an asset class, like gold, like electronic gold, which is the third element that you live. I don't know, I don't want to get up in that thing. What I've, a little, I have a lot, I like the technology, I love the idea of the payment system, especially, I think, improving all of the payment system is going to disproportionately help those who have been poorly served for financial services in the world. So that's not bad. I, I would stamp that, okay? How it's done is a different issue. What I don't find, I, I'm disappointed with is two things. One, uh, <laughs> I haven't seen very much use of blockchain yet that's really exciting and, and important. And, and useful. I think it can be used that. Decentralization is great. But the second thing I would mention is, you know, for someone who has a hammer, they try to make everything out there a nail because they want it to be the right system. And those of you out there, just think for a second. You're all in the business one way or the other. There are times and places and situations where decentralization is more efficient if you can do it. That's the case that's being put out there. You would blockchain, somehow we could decentralize 
But there are also many cases where it's incredibly efficient to centralize. As an options guy, I'm thinking about how do you do all this dynamic hedging that I helped put together a long time ago. Well, one way you can deal with that is if you have it, I won't mention the name, it begins with C, it used to be a hedge fund, it's a big financial institution. It has a lot of options in its book from all kinds of things. I don't mean just traded stuff, but lots of options. They can do, and that C can do a lot of netting of the expenses, of the risks, without transacting at all, and being able to net the book. The thing that we tried to do in 208 on a Sunday with Lehman Brothers, okay? Can't do it. They can do it. We put, forced to put a lot of vanilla swaps all on the CME. Now, we can say we're putting all the eggs in one basket. We better watch that basket pretty darn carefully. But I think we all can agree that getting that kind of netting of the swap books would have been very helpful and will be very helpful. Now, I'm not going to tell you which answers are right. You know, for, I just want you to think about any time you hear someone saying, the answer is decentralization. The answer is whatever. The, it's rare that there's a universal best answer. Which is a better tool, a hammer or a saw? And I'll let you think about that. But imagine knocking a nail in with a saw or taking a nice fine wood leg off a table with a hammer. Of course, the answer is the best tool for the job. So when you're in looking at all this discussion and you hear where the world's going, Web3, whatever, try to think of that as a perspective. Some things are going to be really good and some not. Okay. Well, our second question is, what is the panel's thoughts when it comes to green, sustainable, driven investment, whether it's funds under green frameworks, debt loans, or others? Let me, I'll start if you don't. Please. So yeah, I have a chapter on ESG. <laughs> don't want to be an advertisement for the book, but. Uh, uh, and. Uh, uh, I had to do a lot of thinking. Well, uh, Rob Stampow, who's a colleague of mine at Wharton, has done a, a lot of work and really uh, helped me understand a lot of the principles there. He's written some very recent articles on that. And I, uh, um, there, there's, 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 there's a couple aspects of it. I mean, there's a million aspects of it, but uh, climate hedging if climate is in your utility function, you, you want to hedge against it. Um, it becomes, you know, then, then you're getting off of a, a cap-weighted general portfolio, if, you know, if the only two things that are at risk and return. Uh, so climate is in your utility function. Uh, there might be a, a, a case for, um, you know, having a, a client that would overprice them, so to speak, uh, in, in um, a, a standard cap-weighted a portfolio. Then there's also the preference, um, the the ESG part. If you personally have a preference for that, um, uh, uh, I, I have a. You know, we all know about Milton Friedman's article that was 50 years ago, which was uh, that was actually I think the New York Times Magazine section about you know the primary duty of firms are, are to maximize the, the, the profits for the shareholders. If he would have said value for shareholders and, and made that little shift, believe it or not, you, you could get ESG into that, you know, um, because if people prefer to buy bananas that are fair traded or whatever, and you're a company that sells them, you're going to do better. Um, so it's not that totally ridiculous. It's sort of like, oh, you know, it's all against what Friedman is. And it was a 50th anniversary issue of when of the, that they they ran when uh, of Friedman's original article, um, which uh, mostly people were blasting it as you know, oh, you know, antiquated thought. And we know the business roundtable, you know, shifted for the first time in you know decades to saying it's not the primary function. But if you talk about the value of the shares instead of the profits. Um, in terms of what people might prefer, believe it or not, you can move towards something that is like that. I'm not going to comment 
and of course, if you don't value any of those SG parts, if that's not in your utility function at all, then clearly, if some people think it's they're gonna be overpriced and you'll be better off underweighting those. If climate is in your utility function, then uh, it might be an actual risk that you wanna hedge against. That's some of the items I discussed and some of the recent articles have, have talked about some of those issues. I don't know if you have comment on that, Ralph. Well, brief comment. David Blood, who's one of the most talented people ever worked at Goldman Sachs, and Al Gore formed an organization called Generation. Of course, it's called Blood and Gore. And uh, their concept is we will have a group of analysts who will understand that set of values and will look for companies that are living with those values, an important part of the internality. And over at least a 10 year period, it's clearly proven to be lower in market risk and higher in rate of return. So that it, it harmonizes with what you're making your point. Uh, the only thing I would add, because I can see Andrew standing there, uh, <laughs> is the following. We know the manifest function of markets is transactions. But it has an extremely important, they have extremely important latent function, that's information. And if we can get the right kinds of markets out there related to climate, and they really trade, I think that will be very valuable information in terms of making judgments, assessments, and as well as doing risk hedging. But even if we're not worried about the risk hedging, just getting the information so that we have some kind of way of trade-offs, because we know, even if it's climate, as important as it is, there are trade-offs. It's not infinite price. So that would be the only thing I would really want to. Yeah, it will create more and more need for information and therefore suck information in, and the system will find a way to rebalance yeah, I mean, by providing yeah, more information. It's just that role of markets. So we're almost out of time. And before we close, I do want to touch on two topics that, that didn't come up, but I thought might have come up. But given that it hasn't, maybe um, I'm going to ask Katie, can you say a few words about your work on Crisis Alpha? Because that's particularly relevant given the current events going on now, and uh, that should be part of the perfect portfolio. And then maybe, Mila, I do want you to talk a bit about your paper on uh, women in academic finance and say a few words about that as we close. So Katie? Yes, this is a great um, example recently. So just to give some background, um, I work in the trend following space. And back when I was a student of Andrews, I was really fascinated by rules that people use to invest. So how can you possibly just you know, divorce yourself from making the decisions your, of your portfolio, but actually use a system to trade the markets and wake up every day and do it, which is what I do. <laughs> so, um, and why could that actually work and when? So what I found was studying crisis periods in history during these precise moments, there are moments in history when things are less efficient, when markets are actually very trendy, where people don't know what to do. And it's those precise moments where having a diligent approach, divorcing your emotion from your action, where you can actually find uh, interesting opportunities for portfolios. And so for me, I came up with this term called crisis alpha, inspired by much of the work of Andrew on the adaptive markets hypothesis. And what's been very interesting for me is to watch in every serious crisis environment. In COVID, very successful strategy. This year, very successful strategy. So what we do now is we actually work with large institutions that have realized that 90% of the time, I'm right and I'm probably in the right place. But when things are really difficult, like they are right now, when we need to change, there are actually it's actually important to have strategies in your portfolio that are willing to forget the past and move to the future. And so that has been sort of an interesting area where I've been researching, trying to understand how a simple strategy that should have gone dead many years ago is still actually working in very difficult environments. And that is particularly relevant this year because this year we've seen uh, it's been a very difficult year for equities, and for bonds. 
Thanks. Mila? Thanks. Um, so there is a recent paper we just published uh, in the Journal of Finance this year with Heather Tooks. She is at the Yale School of Management. And uh, she and I have published a couple of papers related to hedge funds, convertible bond arbitrage, and so on. So this is kind of was our first time working on something related to gender in finance. But we thought we needed to do this work because it has not been published in uh, main um, academic outlets. And we just wanted to you know, just survey. This is actually was more like a survey. Let's figure out what is happening. We concentrated on top 100 um, United States acad um, academic institutions, specifically business schools, and looked at um, professors of finance. And pretty much, you know, over the last 10 years, the number of professors have increased, but the percentage of women still, it actually was like flat, 16%, right? So both in men, yes, we have more numbers, but just the percentage stayed the same, uh, tenure rates are staying the same, and so on, though they are improving over time. And we looked at kind of what uh, drives it. And uh, so um, we, we also look at, uh, so one of the, the important, you know, you kind of like a publish or perish, that's the uh, industry we're in. And um, women tend to actually publish less papers. And so we kind of looked at it, what is driving it? Is it just quality because they just cannot publish it? And we looked at the top finance and economics publications and they actually publish at the same rate or even higher. Um, than uh, men specifically in solo authored work, right? So by themselves, they can publish a lot, but the co-authorship, the number of co-authored publications is less, right? So this kind of is very interesting, and it just the number of, and when they co-author, they tend to co-author more with other women. So you can see the percentage is already small, and they are co-authoring with, you know, Katie and I are co-authored and so on, right? And I co-author with other women, and it's it's um, it's definitely uh, smaller. So the so how can we kind of use this opportunity, right? So we need to publish more, or let's kind of use it even here, kind of to reference for. Um, you know, presentations for conferences, right? It's just a great opportunity to, you know, next time you have a meeting, right? Invite a woman, or next time you have a speaker, invite a woman to present or discuss, right? So, and, or collaborate. So it's a, it's a great opportunity just to publish more, and that will lead to their success. And we talked about diversification in terms of assets, and, you know, diversity of thought, and diversity, uh, in terms of uh, women is super important, not just because it is good, but because it actually gets to the bottom line and it increases returns and reduces risk. But the paper we kind of concentrated was just academic um, finance and um, and we, we see things are improving, so we're kind of optimistic and as Andrew mentioned, you know, this is, you know, they kind of will be the Bible, right? But there will be other editions, and hopefully we'll have more uh, top uh, women in the field which we can learn, uh, who we can learn from. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> so on that note, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. For those of you who are MIT alums in particular, thank you for being with us. Uh, I want to tell you about a new um, uh, uh, website that we created called Advisor Hub that links uh, MIT alums with others who are, want to be either mentored or will, are willing to mentor. Uh, and so if you're interested in that, please uh, ask Patsy Thompson uh, for information about it. We'd love to get you involved in Advisor Hub. And as always, thank you for your support. Thank you for being here. Thank you for staying safe and healthy. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. And last but not least, before we close, I do want to thank uh, the Office of External Relations, the alumni group, and specifically Patsy Thompson for putting this event together. Thank you, Patsy. <laughs> Thanks to Bob, Charlie, and Jeremy, and Mila, and Katie for a fantastic panel. Great. We'll see you all. There's a reception outside, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Great. Bye-bye.